welcome. Uh, welcome to this webinar jointly organized by the Economic Research Institute for Asia and East Asia area and the CIE.co. Uh, I'm Julia Mane Marsan, Area Director for, for Strategy and Partnership. Um, and uh, we are here to listen uh, from four amazing speakers. Uh, our moderator will introduce them in a minute. Uh, today, our moderator is Trisha Goshal from the CIE.co, and I will give her the floor very, very shortly. Um, but before that, uh, I just would like to uh, give you a couple of practical information. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for being with us. Please uh, remember to keep your microphone on mute during the entire duration of the webinar. Uh, but also, please, to, please have a look at the chat box and use the chat box to interact with us and the speakers, and also to ask questions to the speakers, because we are going to use your questions in the final segment of this episode uh, for the Q&A. We are here to discuss an extremely important topic with fantastic women entrepreneurs uh, and ecosystem builders from India and ASEAN. Uh, so uh, I don't want to spend any more time. It's really important to hear directly from them. And this is why now I give the floor immediately to uh, Trisha Goshal from the CIE.co. Thank you, Trisha, the floor is yours. Thank you, Julia. Um, hello, my name is Trisha, and I will be your moderator for the day. I work as a specialist in the area of fintech and financial inclusion at uh, CIA.co, uh, which is the, uh, as an organization uh, at CIA.co, we work across the innovation continuum, uh, backing startups with incubation, acceleration, investment, and research. So a very warm welcome to our speakers, our colleagues from IREA and CI.co, and to our participants. Um, there are over 120 of you who are joining us at this moment. Welcome and uh, thank you all for being here. To begin with, it is our belief that with the right tools and interventions, rural women entrepreneurs can transform into powerhouses of innovation and growth. They can pioneer new business models and engineer fresh models of collaboration. Today, we are joined by four inspiring entrepreneurs whose work personifies this belief. Our speakers for today have each done tremendous work engaging, educating, financing, and catalyzing rural women entrepreneurs across Cambodia, Indonesia, and India. We hope to learn from their journey and understand their take on the way ahead for women-centric entrepreneurial ecosystems in the region. Therefore, without further delay, let me introduce our speakers for the day. First off, we are joined by Danica Flesh. Danica Flesh is a trained economist and the founder and CEO of Sukha Chitta, a very interesting social entre uh, enterprise that has been described as changing the standard of Indonesia's craft industry. Sukhachitta empowers women uh, artisans in villages across Indonesia, providing intensive training in craft, design, and business skills, ensuring living wages, and connecting them to a global market. Among her many accolades, Denika's work has been recognized by the Seed Low Carbon Award. She featured on the Forbes Asia list of 30 under 30 in 2019, and was named her woman, her world woman of the year in 2020. Welcome, Danica. Pleasure to have you with us. Great to be here. Great. Um, next, we are privileged to have Chetna Sinha. Chetna Sinha has been described as an activist, a farmer, and a banker. She has spent over two decades living in Indian villages and working with rural women in India. In 1997, Chetna Sinha started the Mandeshi Mahila Sahakari Bank, India's first bank for rural women and by rural women. Over the year, ma years, Mandeshi has loaned over 70 million US dollars and regularly creates new financial products to support the needs of female micro-entrepreneurs. Chetna Sinha is also the founder and president of the Mandeshi Foundation, which is the force behind India's first business school for rural women and the first chamber of commerce for rural uh, women micro-entrepreneurs in India. Chetna Sena is the recipient of many prestigious awards and recognitions. In 2018, she served as a co-chair 
of the World Economic Forum at Davos. She was also conferred the Nari Shakti Puraskar in 2018, which is the highest civilian honor uh, for women in India and is presented by the President of India. Uh, welcome, Chetna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Always. you for joining. Thank you for joining us today. Next, we have Lida Loom. Um, Lida is the co-founder of She Investments, a unique social enterprise that designs and delivers gender-focused and culturally tailored business incubator and accelerator programs for women in Cambodia. She Investments helps women entre micro-entrepreneurs enter the formal sector by providing business training, mentorship, and ongoing support to grow their business and thereby create economic and social impact. One of the first ever recipients of Cambodia's Indra Devi Hope Award for Young Achievers, Lita strongly believes in the power of dreams, self-motivation and action, which has been the key to motivate her success. Welcome Lita, we are very excited to learn from your experiences. Welcome, it's so nice to be here. Thank you. Finally, please join me in welcoming the very dynamic founder and CEO of Frontier Markets, Ms. Ajeta Shah. Frontier Markets is a rural marketing, sales, and service distribution company focused on providing access to affordable and quality consumer durables to low-income households in emerging markets. They do so through an assisted commerce model run by local women entrepreneurs called Sadal Jeevan Sahelis. Frontier Markets has delivered a range of high social impact products, including clean energy, agriculture, health, and water sanitation to the doorsteps of 4.9 million people and over 700,000 rural households across India. Ajeta Shah is an advocate for women-led transformational leadership and believes in rethinking how market-based approaches and social innovation can be leveraged to deliver scalable impact. Among other recognitions, Ajeta is a recipient of the Forbes Top 30 Under 30 Social Entrepreneurs Award and the United Nations Women Transforming India Award. Welcome Ajeta and thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right. So I'll just straight away dive into the discussion and I'd like to go to Denika first. Um, Denika, to begin with, uh, tell us about the story of Sukachitta. How was Sukachitta built from the initial vision to the current business model and the impact that you have had on the lives of thousands of rural women artisans in Indonesia? All right, so hello everyone. My name is Denika and I'm the founder of Sukachitta. We are a social enterprise based in Indonesia that works to end the exploitation of women who make your clothes. So it's important to note that I actually had very or virtually no fashion background. I'm actually a development economist and I returned to Indonesia because I wanted to contribute to Indonesia. And there I started doing my research going village to village and I met the women who changed my life. Because I grew up in the city, I always thought that clothes is just something that showed up in stores automatically. And meeting these women was the first time I actually saw how our clothes are made. It was beautiful, women making things with their hands in their homes, but at the same time, I couldn't help to notice their struggle. It was heartbreaking for me to learn that 98% of women who make our clothes don't even earn a livable wage. At the same time, I was noticing just how dirty our current practices for clothing production is. 25% of the world's water pollution, in fact, is caused just by how our clothes are being dyed. And seeing this reality firsthand made me realize that I wanted to build a bridge between us and these women in the villages so that they can earn a living wage from their craft while at the same time caring for their environment. So I started Sukachita back in 2016, five years ago, with only three women. And today, we're providing access to education and living wages to over 1,000 families in eight villages across Indonesia. We've managed to increase their income by 60% on average, and through the use of only natural dyes, prevented 1.2 million liters 
of toxic chemical waste from our rivers. So when you ask about the, our impact model, and that's really practically everything that we do. So every purchase literally funds all our programs in the villages. And it also funds the building of Rumah Sukacita or our craft schools. Because what, what I believe is that ultimately the only way we can truly solve this issue of exploitation in the long term is through education. So it's really not about just providing work, but it's also providing, providing these women with business training so that they can actually value their own work. And for us, that is what true empowerment is. So that, that's an excellent point, Denika. And um, my next question, which would be to um, Ajeta, is also around uh, the role of uh, capacity building or broadly education. But the question that I want to ask you, Ajeta, is around digital technology and you know building uh, capacity around that. So uh, digital technology is a key aspect of operations at uh, Frontier Markets. Not only do you use a, an end-to-end -end digital platform uh, you know, for, for, for activities from customer onboarding to sales to delivery of services, Frontier Market also leverages digital technologies to discover last mile demand and design appropriate services. What is extremely fascinating about this, that all of these activities are carried out by local women micro entrepreneurs who are associated with Frontier Markets. So what I want to understand is, could you talk about how Frontier Markets works in encouraging women rural micro entrepreneurs or influencers as, as one can call them with the use of technology? What are the challenges that you face in onboarding rural women on digital platforms? And how do you navigate these challenges as an organization? Sure, thank you for that. Um, so they are definitely women influencers. We like calling them the most important influencers um, in any marketplace. Um, so that's for sure. So, I mean, I'll take a step back for a minute and just make sure that uh, how we even came about this design, right? Um, the way Frontier Markets started operating is we said that there was a fundamental gap between where rural people live and where the universe exists in terms of providing services and solutions and opportunities, right? And, and the access gap that we're talking about is massive, right? Uh, where a rural villager lives versus the closest place where they can get um, a loan to healthcare services, to agri-services, to consumer durables is minimalistically five, if not 30 or 50 kilometers away. And to bridge that gap, we said we would build a supply chain through this network of women. Now, it was very important for us to understand the importance the role that women will be playing um, in, in helping us understand the rural customers' needs or their pain points to then deliver services and really design that role in a way that would optimize their um, skills, their own um, um, need on the ground and really design an entrepreneurship program that was meant for them. And what, I'm, what I mean by that is that we need to understand how rural women operate in these villages, right? Number one, they are already doing a hundred different other activities. And so they don't necessarily have the kind of hours in a day to take on a full-time job in addition to what they're already doing, which they're unfortunately not paid for, uh, but it's critical. Second is that they're not necessarily interested in traveling. So I, a lot of times we hear people saying, oh, they're not capable or there's barriers to travel. Actually, women, if they don't have to, don't wanna leave the villages that they're operating in. So ultimately when we designed the opportunity, which was more important than understanding the challenge to onboarding them digitally, is we designed an opportunity that was really meant for women to have their cake and eat it too. Here's a program where you're leveraging your social capital, you're not leaving your village, there's flexible hours. And by connecting with the people that you know, you'll be a market linkage solution and create um, income opportunities for yourself, but then also dignity for yourself in terms of being a solutions provider in your village. So that in itself as an opportunity was very exciting for rural women. So actually getting them to want to become Sahelis was not difficult at all, right? People weren't saying, in fact, let me become a Saheli because I actually believe that this job or this opportunity was best created for me. Now, the digital challenge, of course, is that do these women have smartphones? Do they have internet connectivity? 
And if they don't have these two things, any which ways, there's a massive barrier, right, for them to be able to adopt to this kind of solution. Because everything that they would be doing with us would be based on an app, a Mary Saheli app. But ultimately, if they had those two things, a smartphone, even just a smartphone, not even internet, but a smartphone, the way that we created our technology platform was that we designed it with them. So we actually designed it where it was simple to use, easy to understand, um, voice enabled, you know, localized. So actually getting them to learn how to use the app, there is a training tool that trains them on the go on a regular basis. So the barriers that would have otherwise existed, right? Not comfortable using a smartphone, not necessarily knowing how to collect data, not necessarily knowing how to communicate with these entrepreneurs or what to even showcase on a platform. We kind of built the technology in a way that it would um, reduce those barriers. Nonetheless, I think the larger challenges still do exist that um, no matter how good your training tool is, there is a, a, a gap in terms of experience, right? Most, um, most rural women, even if they have a phone, they don't have it with them on a regular basis. And even if it is their own phone, they've, they're slowly catching up on all the various things that one can do with a smartphone. Everything from, you know, adding contacts to your sheet, making sure the phone number is correct. But at the same time, they've also gotten very savvy on taking photos, knowing how to use WhatsApp, knowing how to showcase things, knowing how to make phone calls. So it's been a combined effort, I think, on saying, A, make sure you're designing the right income opportunity that makes it very easy for you to onboard women. B, Make sure your technology is actually designed in a way that you're understanding the barriers that women have in terms of, which is not their fault. It's an experience issue. And C, bridge what they do know to continuously train them on the fly. And I think that's worked um, quite well, but it is an ongoing effort, right? We still do support them with other tools that are digitally capable. Small things that we know are challenging to scale this is that women don't know how to find Google Play Store you know, download the app and then get their user ID, right? So there are other ways to fix that, right? Using WhatsApp, we now created a quick link. People just have to click on the link and then there's an automated process for them to take on things that they're not aware of. So I think these were small, small learnings that I think we've had over the period of time. Designing, um, finding simple processes that can be educative materials to let people know how to do certain things. But then most importantly, create a job opportunity that actually excites them. So they want to actually be coming on board and earning income effectively. That's that's ex that's very interesting. What you're, um, as I understand, you're talking about a graduated approach that you start where you begin with what they know, and then you sort of top it up with uh, uh, with more information, more functions, and uh, and ease the cognitive load, the the, the ability to absorb new information. Uh, thank you for that, Ajita. Um, Lida, I'd like to come to you now, and uh, the question that I want to ask you is quite adjacent to what uh, Ajeta was just talking about. So, um, so uh, Ajeta spoke of uh, of, of digital, uh, you know, uh, rural women who are digitally naive. They they do not know how. They don't even own smartphones, and 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 she emphasized how creating an income opportunity incentivizes. Uh, this sort of an uptake and, and enthusiasm to learn. Uh, what you have done at, uh, uh, at Shee Investments is uh, you have created uh, something called Cotrary, which is a bookkeeping app. And bookkeeping app that helps rural women micro entrepreneurs manage their businesses, um, understand business functions, understand the financial uh, uh, tools and knowledge that they need in order to uh, 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 manage their business on a, on a routine basis, and and these are complex concepts. So, uh, how were you able to um, sort of bring all of it together into an app that functions effectively, and uh, and also so that is my more specific question broadly. Also, uh, what do you think are the current gaps in how digital and financial tools are designed for uh, uh, women entrepreneurs in rural areas? Yeah, thank you. Uh, before, before I answer the question, uh, uh, the first, uh, you all hear me clear? 
Yes, we can hear. You. Good, thank you. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, to be start, I maybe start a little bit. Uh, why we call here investment, and that uh, why we come with the uh, all the funds uh, create a innovation with a financial tool uh, for our women and also the digital literacy for our women currently. Yeah. So I can I can say the gap of that. But let me bring a little bit of the history. So the first, um, uh, when we start here investment, we are thinking of like uh, bring the women to invest, <laughs> like link them to investor. But when 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 we deeply study about the investor and when we deeply study about our women in Cambodia, there's a huge gap. There are more than sixty five women in Cambodia. They are running business, but they are very micro and small. And that's the reason that. Oh my God, that is the idea to bring the investment. <laughs> so it's kind of like um, uh, meet together with all other two co-founders from Australia and then sit down together and we decide to do like a huge um, uh, assessment together. And we finally said that we, we are not the right step yet uh, for the investment for the women in Cambodia. So there is a huge gap that we need to fix and, and we see that huge problem. And we, we know that if the problem wasn't fixed or closed that gap, which means that it can improve a lot economic in Cambodia. But the most importantly is um, strengthen the women economic. And the, when we strengthen the women economic, uh, we, we, we kind of deal a lot of problems. The violent issue, the decision making in family, uh, the children education, yes, and the, the, the community, sets and the community together. And that is the, the big reason behind. So we kind of start with like a QRO program and a Serata program. Along the way, we found that a lot of things we learned from them. And we see like a lot of things, why there's a lot of tools that are available in the market and they kind of use. And we can see, and, and I, I really agree with Ajata, yes? Like when we work out and we through and uh, uh, work out with them and we really learn from them, listen from them, and we can see what is the problem. Yeah. So a lot also we our women, they um a lot of the tools that we have in Cambodia, uh, especially uh, regarding to the digital or the financial tool, they're all in English, mostly in English. Yeah. And they're all very uh the uh, high tech, high level, and high education. For example, like in this world, um, in talking around uh, accounting, we have like standard accounting and the cash accounting. And, and coming to that, most of them don't know about it at all. Yes, even though the person who learn about accountant, they don't know what is the cash accountant. So we start to learn from that, we start to learn from the background and we start why those tools not work and put together, we interview with a lot of women and put the idea together. So this is how we come with the criteria. And this criteria we not do just only the uh, 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 one person and that's finished. <laughs> we do and then we test and the women say that, oh, it's still difficult. Even though our developer think that it's already answer what they need, but actually, when we do the prototype with them, they said that it's still complicated. Yeah. So in this, how we simplify it? We we need to find the simplest process. Yeah. Very simple. Something that really work. Them something that they can try. They can experience and they can trust themselves. They can confident themselves that they can use it. Yeah. So this is something like that. We how we we create that. And we really acknowledge their experience. We, we acknowledge their, their, their background, their education, their community, and we really adapt, but adapt in the right ways. So which means that we need to try to find what is the best for them. Yeah, but at the same time, we also reinforce something that they need to learn. Yeah. And so we come along with the criteria, but we also come along with the financial literacy uh, um, uh, training that we can support them to understand what people are basic. I think I, I can't wait to uh, hear from uh, uh, Jenna that she can uh, sharing about how she opened the bank for the rural women. But I really I can't wait to hear about her. Yeah. So this is how we work, and um, 
I started thinking like, actually, they want to improve, they want to do something better for their own life, but they don't really have like the support system or the system that really allow them or include them to in that process. So this is how we find. And, and what is our uh, strategy? We find the best role model. We cannot uh, influence a thousand million women just doing that. It's just like we really need the right person at the beginning. The right person that can lead, the right person that can inspire, him, the right person that commit. So this how can we split out our program and split out our app? Yeah. And the same way, when we're talking about the digital literacy, there are still a big gap between the city people, city women, the city that work in the the women that in the city and the women in the rural area. Yeah. And <laughs> I just like interesting like what is important tool is just like answer the phone and we said that they have a somehow they have a smartphone but they never install any app on that and they said that it's so complicated and one day I do the demo one of the same very very simple thing about the design and I said oh my god why it's so easy <laughs> so that, yeah they are afraid to touch the button they feel not soft they just don't know how to do it they scare so this is how can we bring that and we start to design our uh, curriculum one experience and go to practice. Yes, yeah, something that they finish and they directly something that they can be work in their daily lives, either the personal or the business. Yes. I hope that answers your question. That I think very beautifully and exhaustively answers my question. Um, so you are, uh, maybe if I can just uh, uh, summarize some of the key points that I picked up. Uh, you talk about deep engagement, like you, you cannot do a cursory survey and figure out what is missing and then try to design. You have to be embedded within the, com uh, within the community, you have to speak to the women, learn about their knowledge systems, and then sort of bring in your uh, expertise. And what is very interesting to me is, is, uh, is the iterative process that you mentioned, that you have to keep going back to them and keep figuring out what is the shortest way, what is the easiest way, simplest way to uh you know develop this tool um and uh, uh, so i'll come to uh, chetna ma'am now and uh, uh, lida thank you for already posing the question that i was i was hoping to uh, uh, get uh, uh, chetna ma'am's view on um uh, so uh, you have uh, you know in, in india women's uh, participation in business in rural india is often a survival strategy as opposed to an entrepreneurial endeavor. Um, so that thinking sort of, you know, um, many women who are starting their own businesses are not, maybe not coming from that uh, intellectually from that uh, entrepreneurial outlook. Now, um, as part of Mandishi, you've spent over two decades supporting female micro entrepreneurs uh, across rural India by extending a combination of uh, uh, tailored financial products, entrepreneurial education and training, community messaging, and more recently by partnering on a social impact fund for women micro entrepreneurs. So across your entire spectrum of interventions, uh, what was your go-to strategy to understand the needs and aspirations of the women that you were working with? How did you discover their capabilities, their limitations, and what their hopes for their own businesses were. Over thank you. You. And um, thanks. It was so interesting to listen to all young, talented mind. And so I'm very honored to be a part of this young team. So thanks. You know, when I, like, as you mentioned, since last two decades, I've been working or I would say that I've been learning a lot with uh, women entrepreneurs in rural areas. And uh, so I see that, or I've seen that there are two types of entrepreneurship in India, if you see across in the villages. One is that entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs, with no, there was no choice and I became a, an entrepreneur. So it's like, you know, I have uh, family owned land, it's very uh, marginal or, 
and then I have not, I have to do something. I am dropped out or not educated at all. And so maybe I rear sheep and goat, maybe I buy buffaloes or cow I want to. So those category of entrepreneurs, Madina Kai. Sorry. Sorry for that. So those category of entrepreneur. And one category is entrepreneur by choice. It's again like I'm dropout. I couldn't do what I wanted to do, but now I want to do it. And so I find this very interesting in women, particularly while in working in rural India, where all the everything, you know, if you see their life and when they share with you, they every time there is a denial. Education, no. You have to get married. After marrying, you want to start a business or even before parents will say, no, you, whatever you want to do, you do it after your marriage. So no support for even if you want to become an entrepreneur. After marriage, something to do, no. Have children first, be mothers, then you do whatever and no support at all. If any losses are going to happen, we don't know anything you will have to leave the house. So that is the situation. In that situation, I saw that even in spite of all these challenges and denials, women are saving savings because they, they have seen that from their family to the whole other setup that is mainstream setup is like banks or institutions, colleges, schools, markets, everything. In your house, there is a denial, there is denial everywhere. And in spite of that challenging situation, they are ready to save, to buy either a buffalo or to buy some small machine where they can start the tailoring part or whatever, very small things, small dreams and saving lonely to do that. And so that actually, and then, coming with so much ambitious, like, how should I do it? And that was how this Mandeshi Bank came up. I'm not going into those details, but I'm just saying that this is how rural women start their thing. Start from me, show the action of savings or whatever, and then see what support I'm getting it. And that in spite that support does not come from your loved ones or family or even the mainstream market member and then see that how collectives I can form and do it. And that's how so even Mandishi Bank was the formation of women coming together. Of course, I mean, my role was very significant, but it would have not been possible if women would not have come forward to say that, OK, we want to save, we want to mobilize the capital. And yes, we'll, we'll do it together and get the banking license. So that one thing which is that, yes, we can do that confidence and courage they have within themselves, which gives us an inspiration to go ahead. And when I say that, now I would come to uh, share that today with like more than Mandishi has reached and impacted more than half million women in across three states of India by providing capital, by providing credit, and not only just providing loans or debt, but helping women to save and get the loan, make themselves credible in the banking sector. It's not just getting an access from the Mandishi Bank, but make themselves. And how do you do that? Is that whatever create those ecosystems. So you have your own rating, be part of the mainstream rating that is civil rating, all these ratings are there in the banking sector where you, if your ratings are good, then you get an access to capital and all. So that is prepare yourself for an access to the mainstream sector of the banking and the market. And so then these sectors will be ready to invest in you. That is one. And then the second part, which Mandeshi Bank takes it very important is that, and I hear I will share you a, one of the story of one of the women from whom we learned so much is Aranjana. 
who actually, of course, during COVID, who, her whole family lost the job. Her husband was working with Builder, lost the job. And she was actually doing a small job of tailoring, but and supporting the family. And act, her plan was to support her daughter to go to the graduate school. But when everybody lost the job, she was like, no, where, how would I be able to make that sure that my daughter does not, does not get dropouts as I have been. And so she came forward and she said that actually, I want to set up the so a small factory of mask. And we thought that, you know, in all this situation, she has a plan. Now, the matter is that how do we make sure that she can do it? And so then we decided Monday, she has a bank and business school. So we, th we saw that many women can come with such plans. So how do we do it? So the first thing we worked out is that what she requires is to set up the mask unit is she's ready to learn how to use the machines. So machinery. So design the hypothecation pro credit product for women to buy the machinery. Clear cut banking credit product, which says that we will give you loan for buying the machinery to set up your manufacturing unit. Very clear. And it's a hardcore classic banking product. And I, I find it that it has to be defined in such a way that the mainstream bank, banking sector will pick it up as a very important product where you are not going to lose get the NPA. So hypothecate that if the repayment does not come, you take the machine so that women will repay in time and you train your women that you have to repay monthly installment through business school by financial literacy. So we designed that and she bought the machinery, but now she wanted to buy the clo cloths, right? Raw material, everything. How would she do that? So then create a, another component of the debt credit product for working capital. So provide a working capital loan and hypothecation loan together. And that working capital loan can be like, you know, but whatever you have saved three times of your savings. So here also there is an accountability that I save and you give me three times of savings. So banks feel confident. You know why I'm saying this is that we, if we tell bankers that, you know, you are not doing your job, then they will say poor people are, do not repay. So no, no, no. Poor people are ready to save. They are ready to put their money first. Then you put it. So you get the confidence. So then we designed this product and gave a loan to Ranjana. You know what is the result today? Today, Ranjana has made more than 60 lakhs mask in one year with all her machinery and working capital. And she has two wheeler under her 40 women are trained and selling masks. There is no hardcore manufacturing unit, but she is producing 60 lakhs mask in one year and given a job to 40 women. Now, when I'm sharing that, her share is much more bigger in reviving the jobs, in reviving employment, in creating those ecosystem of civil rating for other women also, then how much capital and the loan amount what Mandeshi has put in. So what I'm trying to explain is that it's very interesting how you can get if one role model of Ranjana brought more than 48,000 women to come forward because of this product of hypothecation and working capital given together to women entrepreneurs so that they can start a business with machinery on scale. They can create the jobs. They can repay the loan in time. They can be on the uh, credit linkage, credit rating tools of mainstream banking sector. So after getting Mandeshi Bank, they can go to other bank like State Bank of India and other that we have repaid Mandeshi Bank with machinery 
and working capital loan in time and we are a credible client with our rating so give us bigger loan and they are part of e-commerce website so the bankers know their trajectory of the sales and bankers know that they have done that much of business so with this i would just like to share trisha that these women actually have proved themselves that micro credit industry is 20 billion dollar industry in india only in asia i don't know how much big it is but still micro credit could not become a micro enterprise industry and now it is only possible when you have these collectives of experiences like what ajaita had and what lida had and uh, what uh, denika has that these are the women entrepreneurs who are going to create the whole ecosystem of micro enterprise and bankers like us e-commerce like amazon or flipkart in india are going to learn how do you do financial inclusion digital inclusion market inclusion and finally these women entrepreneurs are going to change the index of india's index of gender uh, index of entrepreneurship where out of 100 entrepreneurs we are not even seven today and out of 100 enterprise which are financed by banks even not one percent is financed by banks to women so they will make sure that these people change and invest in women thank you thank you ma'am um, absolutely one cannot overstate the importance of of, of bridging uh, the needs of of the underbanked with the offerings of the formal banking sector and uh, it is truly a fascinating story that you've just told us and uh, uh, so earlier uh, um, you spoke about uh, social barriers uh, as to how as women uh, from from each stage of life to the other there are these constant social barriers that they have to sort of um, uh, contend with um i would like to come to uh, denika come back to denika and uh, so uh, social barriers are are one kind of um, are, are, are one uh, barrier that that rural women deal with. There are also obviously limited and unequal opportunities. Um, there, the legal protection standards offered or accessible to women-owned businesses, especially in rural areas, is 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 much compromised. Um, they do not have the same access to. Uh, business education as their male or urban peers. Uh, so in your experience, how can Sukha Chitta aspire, um, inspire and support more rural craftswomen to the drive for entrepreneurship in the creative industry? Over to you. That's a really interesting question, Trisha, because it's exactly like what Chetna just said, right? Without doubt, women are really the backbone of rural communities. And in our experience, when you lift one woman up, she lifts her entire community with her. And I love what Chetna shared because that's exactly what we've been doing in Sukachita as well. It's really not to treat women as really our employees, but instead we, what we do is what we call a Jawara Desa program, where in every village we select one local champion who gets access to microcredit and then business trainings so that she can set up her own social enterprise. And then I feel that that's really the only way we can change this on a larger scale because by doing that, we are literally pushing them out of the informal sector into the, the visible formal sector. Because as you say, protection for women in rural areas in Indonesia is virtually non-existent. And I think that's really the important um, today with all the technology that we have is to use all these uh, possibilities to really shine a light on that and then to allow more women to do that. Because as you said, there are social barriers in, in the villages where there are certain jobs that are not uh, allowed for a woman to do. But the creative sector is actually the second largest employing sector for women in rural Indonesia. 
And that's why we feel like there's a lot of potential for us to be scaling in that sense. And then by doing so, really bringing more women out of poverty while bringing them into the formal sector. Thank you for that, uh, Danica. Um, Ajeta, I would like to bring a similar question to you. Uh, given the current uh, Indian startup uh, space, uh, what do you think, uh, what kind of uh, business models or frameworks do you think would be most effective in engaging rural women in entrepreneurship? So uh, we have spoken about barriers. Uh, um, uh, Danica just, just spoke about the, um, the sort of gaps in, 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 that, that women in, in Indonesia face. So in the Indian context, what do you think would work best? in order to inspire that, that kind of an entrepreneurial drive and confidence, probably. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I'm literally in the middle of thinking about this at a, lar at a large level and scale. And in fact, as usual with Chetna, uh, with Chetna here, it's always good to try to bounce ideas at the same time. So um, again, let's take a step back, right? Um, the, what's great about India, especially in the last two or three years, is that there is a very large startup culture right? Uh, you have government support uh, very targetedly on promoting um, having younger people, fresh startups, like early stage startups arise. And you've seen this growth exponentially. Um, and then there is even a percentage or a portion that I would say has been coming in with a gender lens, which is whether it's through the women empowerment platform, economic platform through Niti Aayog, or whether there are these accelerators that have come together. But let's be clear, none of that is touching rural women entrepreneurs, right? Rural women entrepreneurs I, are not being encouraged to be a part of this ecosystem because frankly, no one knows how to bring them in, in what structure, in what way, shape or form. And I think it is a really, really big barrier and a gap. And, and I think the gap honestly is because to be honest, um, we started working with the state level rural livelihood missions recently. And if you look at a lot of, I think the, the definition that Chaitana had mentioned about the two different kinds of entrepreneurs is so apt, it's so bang on, right? Like the majority of these women entrepreneurs are the ones that are going, I can herd a goat, I can do this, or the livelihood mission comes in and suddenly says, why don't you start producing X or why don't you start making Y? And all of a sudden you have this like disaggregated ecosystem of individual entrepreneurs that are making things because someone told them that they should, and have no idea how to sell it or where to sell it and actually grow their business, right? It's a really big gap, right? And the disaggregation is not just the fact that it's like, you know, honestly um, spread across all over the place with no real planning, but also that um, ultimately um, they, there's no data that is behind it easily, right? So if I sit with, you know, the SLRMs today, the state level rural livelihood missions today, and I say, can you at least give me the data on which SAG is making what, right? Just so I can understand what is happening. And so I can start thinking about where our platform can help them get access to local markets. It's not there. So we don't even know who they are and where they are and what they're making and how to even organize them in a cost-effective aggregated sort of way to bring them into a startup structure. So that's a big one. The other major challenge also is that if you look at the way Startup India is structured versus if you look at the way businesses or the kind of structures that businesses are created in rural India, again, it's different, right? Startup India is all about private limited companies, right? Pri primarily. Whereas rural businesses are farmer producer, non-farmer producer organizations, uh, cooperative societies, right? And maybe now most recently thinking about creating a public limited company structure. All of those structures today are not allowing professional systems to come into play because the ownership structure is not based on wealth opportunity creation or professional business creation within a structure, right? You have democracy, you have politics, and you have um, access to capital, which is working capital and government grants, but it's not structured in a way that is allowing us to bring this ecosystem of people even aggregated into a startup ecosystem, which is traditionally more professional KPI driven, equity blended capital coming in, giving you know, the kind of tools that Chetna is talking about, which I believe is more categorized in the second definition that she was bringing. But 
again, few and far between of those kind of entrepreneurs when you see this in the rural structure. So I'm scratching my head on this also. Like, I don't know what are the best business models right now because I have been analyzing all these different existing business models in rural India, which I frankly believe is not necessarily the best yet to kind of bring it in. I learned a lot from talking to great, uh, again, pioneers in the space like industry, like Ranga Sutra, um, like even, um, you know, um, Pradhan uh, and Tasser, where they have organized and structured more um, uh, aggregated systems for professional out outlets to do market linkages for the crafts and the artisan world, where you produce something, we organize it, we link the market for you. But that's still a vendor service agreement, right? It's not that these women are owning an asset, which is the company's success in creating share value. So I have a crazy idea, which I was literally just writing to Chetana right now, but I was saying that even in our system, one individual Saheli, as a micro entrepreneur, um, is not gonna end up over a period of time setting up her own startup business, right? It's, it's just not feasible given her market size where she is. And to avail that independently, there's so much stuff that has to happen, right? Creating a board, creating a structure, there's a registrations, there's a lot of issues. So we, but we believe that the opportunity of a woman owned collective, which is structured as a private limited could be very powerful. And it could be a startup, but it's an aggregated startup of micro entrepreneurs. And you are actually giving them the benefits of what being a startup is, right? But some way or the other, accountability and management still means that you need other professionals, right, into that system to really make that happen. So is it a co-owned model, but you're actually giving these women true shareholding opportunity? Because the whole point of startup culture and setting up businesses is that the share value as it grows, dividends should be benefited by the owners themselves. And you're supposed to be able to leverage that capital to then get larger capital to grow even further. There's no existing structure like that today um, in the rural space. So unfortunately, so there's learning models. There's models that have allowed us to create more professionalism, maybe like unlock some working capital, um, increase income, but it hasn't necessarily created the power of what I think setting up startups and businesses could offer. Um, and I think, but I think it'll happen, right? I think we're starting to see more people thinking about this. Could you create public limited companies that aggregate people? Could you create trusts where you can create ownership in a different way? And how do we, as I think leaders, um, start doing exactly, I think where Jaitna has already come in with, like saying like, you learn over a period of time, right? In terms of where the evolutions can happen. Um, but I think we need, like, we need more partners to also come in because we don't know the answers to all of it, right? So we know how to create markets. We know how to, uh, onboard women entrepreneurs, but I think somewhere there's a new design that needs to come in and I don't know if it's there yet. That's it's a very, I think uh, you've given us a lot of food for thought um, because we've, we've also been hearing about, uh, you know, um, organize women in FPOs, have them, in, you know, bring together the SGs and, and figure out what value chains women are part of and, and then try and uh, help them build a business around it as opposed to the structure that you're talking about, which is self-driven, which is owned, uh, where, uh, where, where, where the uh, women who are in the business have complete ownership over, uh, over the business. Um, but yeah, uh, I agree that um, I, I think it is an evolving system. And uh, I think the next few years are going to be quite interesting in terms of where things go. Um, uh, so thank you, Ajeta. Uh, Lida, I'd like to come back to you. Uh, so uh, my question to Ajeta was about how do you incentivize uh, uh, rural women to take up entrepreneurship? And, and, and we spoke about how uh, in India, the, the ecosystem is, is kind of is disaggregated, like you know, entities don't really talk to each other. Um, from your experience, I'd like to understand uh, so uh, she investments uh, area of focus is to enhance uh, community incubators and micro enterprises. So uh, from your perspective, what are the main challenges? So considering that women do get into it, uh, they, they start they start leading their own, own enterprises, but 
uh, what challenges do you see uh, in in terms of uh, you know rural women uh, led entrepreneurs um, in terms of growing their businesses um, and how how is she investment sort of addressing that? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Really, it's an important question, and a lot of they um, by that I meet, also, also a lot of people that I meet are probably asking that question. So yeah, um, it's kind of like uh, happened a lot of countries, yeah, including Cambodia itself. So um, I realized it until I I really work in that in the like around seven years now. So yeah, so. Um, Start by this. When the women, most of women in the rural area or the low income women uh, or the rural community, when they start a business, they don't call the business. They just said that this is the extra activity that they do to support their family. So, which means that they don't see themselves as a business owner, they don't see themselves as the entrepreneur. And that is the big question. And when, so this is, this is how it happened, right? So, so we asked a lot of questions and he said, that, oh, what do you do? Uh, I, I, I don't do anything, just do a little bit. Uh, I selling a grocery, um, I selling a, a, a Khmer noodle, you know, so we have a noodle, but kind of Khmer noodle. And, and we asking them, do you see themselves as a business owner? And they said, no, I just sell a little bit, you know, like kind of like that, yeah? So it's kind of the big, uh, the big, the big challenge, the big barrier. So I, I don't want to talk about like, like the cultural barrier, like a lot of things because like a lot of you like address this already. So I think that um, we want to really address is about the women herself, don't see herself as the entrepreneur. Yeah. So which means that the way that uh, she investment try to overcome the challenge, they try to understand how can we support them to see themselves as the businesswoman, as the entrepreneur, right? So, and we believe that the mindset is the way out. And that's why in our training, we are focused on building the critical thinking and the creative thinking. And all every activity that we create, we asking a lot of big questions. And most of them, it's really hard for them to answer. But we make it fun and we make it small stuff that they believe that I can do it. So the, it's, not, it's not about how much the design of the program uh bachelor or the degree or how much you know that they know it's not important about that it's important you need to design the learning process that able to include all of them to join with the process and to express their idea and to use their brand more actively and proactively so that is very important that is very very important of that and and when we believe that, uh, 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 when we do that kind of system, like involve them with a lot of questions, uh, problem solving, and also like they have like a group coaching together, a woman coaching a woman together, and they can find like the best solution and the solution is right for them. It's not right for me, and it's not right for co-founder, and it also, it's not right for the funder but it's right for them. And just small action chain, like they do and, and, and repeatedly do it. And the small action can change a huge result. And I didn't believe of that, right? So that's one thing. They never communicate with their husband about household work. After they joined the training, they said that, oh my God, I realized that 90 of my time invest in the family, invest in the household. We call it the word investment. We don't want to call it the waste. Yeah, investment. Yeah, investment within return. Yeah, you can return in whatever. Yeah, but we want them to see that every time that they do is investment, right? So we start them to sing. We asking only one question: Do you want to keep 
to do in this or do you want to change this and if you want to change this what is one small action that you want to do tomorrow and if i say <laughs> what is important ha ah, okay i might talk with my husband to share only one small thing just send the kids to school and i said wow good <laughs> just do it and you know that just small action do small action every single day she become aware that time management they're responsible what is important for her what is not important why should delegate what i should collaborate increase her confidence or communication negotiation so it's kind of this is a step you know when we want to build the people uh, increase them uh, entrepreneurship or the as a business owner to 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 be lead the organization or to be lead their business it's the process we cannot go there and then hey if you want to be a real business owner they say one two three four five you to do it's not about that it's about hey now let's figure it out what is the big barrier for you why something that is really stopping you and what are the small one thing that you want to do actually in our workshop in each workshop we provide them a tool and we coaching them along the tool our training is not like go there and facilitate the talk we go there and we are coach we go there and let them to practice we go there let them to express and the more they express the more they practice the more they gain confidence and they, they repeat it again and again they increase confidence and when we finish the program they always say that i don't know why now i can talk in public i don't know why now i can communicate with uh, of, of my family a brother, a brother family they have my parents my husband my son my daughter i can communicate that all the issue right now i can a lot of express my feeling i can express a lot of my uh, prop, like solving the problem kind of like that so a lot of things so this is how we do with the process yeah so in some up which means that when we are go there to help them we need to believe in their potential we need to believe that they have the full potential to be deal with their own uh, to be deal and to be find their own solution and we need to trust them okay we need to trust them if you not trust them no reason you go there and help them right if you trust you not trust that they gonna you can they not change don't go there okay if you go to that community and you trust that this community gonna change these women that i work with gonna change you have fully of trust like that and you will see the result of that so that's it thank you thank you Lita. um so you're I think largely you're referring to the importance of um, engaging uh, uh, with the, the cohort of, of women entrepreneurs with, with their own trust, getting them to trust their own thoughts and getting them to trust their own needs and feelings, um, which is just an interesting sort of maybe a, a very soft sort of a, a, a segue into getting into uh, getting them to attune their thought process to how a business can be run, like it's, it's you know, like a kernel of um, like the germ of it, sort of. Yeah, yeah. I just want to add like this: it's like when 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 the business run is 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 it's, it's, it's about a, a a business mindset, like about their own their own mindset, their, their own purpose, what they want the business go right. But if they could not found themselves, they could not found their purpose. They should, could not found what they are really value in what they are doing it's very hard yeah so we uh, most of them like they come up with like the idea just to survive well, just to have an income even though very small income we exactly are not like that yeah we exactly are not like that that they completely rise what they are doing what but we go there just want them to be a better process for them a better something that is a better guideline for them right so which means that something that they are really want to invest in and when we are buying by when when we when we create a space that really empowering inspiring them and and to see that hey hey this is the way that i can go at least one small step i can do now and and that's why we empowering them by small activity when we start first, very small activity, 
very small, very simple, no need money, just their own behavior only. And when we do is come back and share, come back and share, come back and share. The more they share, the more they're empowering the community. Yeah, this is that I, I, I just want to add this about like building their own mindset, their own entrepreneurial mindset, yeah. In, in incremental doses of rise in mm. confidence. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to go to uh, Chetna Ma'am now. And uh, so broadly also want to bring you in on the same question that while starting a business in itself is a big accomplishment, uh, women micro entrepreneurs, they face ongoing challenges with respect to funding, growth, scaling. So in this context, when you don't have an enabling environment, but the, 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 the adequate market linkages do not uh, exist, then you know you sort of, they sort of get stunted. They cannot access high value markets. So um, Ajayta spoke about how the, the larger uh, uh, rural entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, is, is sort of out of alignment with maybe what we are seeing at, at, at the grassroots. So from your experience, uh, what kind of partnerships do you see emerging um, uh, currently and in the near future that can uh, that have the potential to mitigate these uh, barriers to growth for women micro entrepreneurs? Thank you, Tisha. And I'll try uh, to address this question also, which I missed of the lab, previous question on social impact fund which you mentioned, so I, I would put some light on that also. But coming first on the partnership. So, and also I was very uh, uh, convinced what Ajaita said that, you know, when you are looking at the partnership is, the partnerships, what they are offering, um, like either it is a government or it is the, uh, corporate world coming with the CSR money or it is uh, the semi uh, government like SIDBI, a small scale industrial development corporations or uh, Janadhan with the public uh, banks, nationalized banks, right? Where these are the partnership who comes with to support women entrepreneurship. And at the same time, there are some non-financial partnerships like designing the uh, market linkage for marketing the products of the women who are uh, in the remote locations or a partnership uh, where you uh, having like building those apps which uh, actually was mentioned in the previous speakers also right so a lot of different different partnership one side finance finance and other side ecosystem building partnerships. So let me give you some concrete examples where Mandeshi built the partnership and how um, the challenges were addressed. So now I would just give you that uh, Mandeshi Bank has a partnership with Small Scale Industrial Development Corporation in India that is said B under their one particular scheme that is Prayas under which they finance micro enterprise owned by women so they do and they appoint an agency like mandeshi bank to find out those enterprise number one to train them with digital financial literacy and the credit link because they are going to get the credit so train them about their credit rating thing and then also deliver the credit product to them and then repayment. So we had a partnership with, and, and of course, when you have these huge partners, they also talk of scale. So they would say like, you know, lending to say 5,000 women and some uh, crores of rupees, or I would say millions of rupees. And then at the same time, when you are implementer, you also need to get that margin to, because those partnerships are not grants. You have to be sustainable with your margins, what you will be earning for, from the borrowers in that way. So we did partnership with SIDB and we agreed and did MOU also. Now, when I'm saying that these MOUs are also very important, the, when you do partnership, now in this case, because it is 
you are give, doing partnership to give loan to the last mile with the implementing agency like Mandeshi Bank. So when they are giving loan, they will write it that repayment is yours responsibility, right? Now you have to be very careful about that also. On one side, how bank will see that protect its safeguards, its own interest. On the similar side, when you do partnership, because when you are doing, like when Mandishi Bank is doing partnership, it is doing on behalf of women, right? So you safeguard their interest. So then when they say that repayment is your responsibility, we say that y'all are not going to do the legal cases on them unless we say yes. Because it is, see, why I'm saying this is so important that these women, after so many challenges, they can fail. And if they fail, that is not a criminal offense and allow them to fail. Otherwise, models are not going to come forward. But we make sure that bank does not lose this. That is also fine. Why I'm saying this is that in India, we have witnessed farmer suicide because banks went after them for recovery. So we have to be very careful and we saw crisis in microcredit industry also. So that is very, very important when I'm talking that onus is on us when we design the partnership. Make sure that are we protecting our stakeholders, safeguarding them when we are entering into the partnership. So now here what we did were, was maybe that women whom we approach, they are first time borrower. They may not have credit rating. You will agree to those borrowers. Because you are government money, government money should take risk. That is number one. So I do think that while partnership you have to, and at the same time, while having a partnership, it is always important to make sure that your partner who is who has come as a partnering with you to support your stakeholders or your women uh, enterprise, try to see that that partner is partnership is retained. So safeguard their risk also, because otherwise you don't want the partnership to like, you know, do one time and we didn't have a proper experience. So make sure and discuss, it may take time to, you know, finalize the partnership. But so, and I'm giving you other example also, when we were doing partnership with National Skill Development Corporation of India, they were going to give us loan to Mandeshi Foundation to train the women uh, entrepreneurs. They didn't say entrepreneurs, but skilling, train in capacity building in skilling and then placement. And we said that the whole MOU is fine, but placement we will not agree because if in rural India, there are no industry, how are you going to place them? How are you going to provide the jobs? And national skill development said that we have this format which is for all the NGOs same so we said then maybe we do not want to take loan from them make sure that on behalf of them sometimes you have to say no say that either change otherwise we are not doing partnership and I am telling sharing with you that National Skill Development Corporation agreed and we were the first organization that they signed that it is not placement but entrepreneurship and yes, once you do the linkage with the bank is important, we'll make sure that they get loan for the micro enterprise. So I do think that because as Ajaita very well said that these agencies who come forward to become partners of grassroots organizations, the this model they have and ideas they have, those are so mismatched with the grassroots structures. And so here, when you do, or, or I would give you the partnerships when people say that we want to provide you the investment in social impact fund also, or invest in funds, investors consider that there will be equity in the organization. These structures, as Ajaita mentioned, absolutely. And we have to be very clear in the beginning that if it is a collectives of a women, either it is a public limited company or what is our structure and have to be sure that there is no concept on of equity in our structure. 
in our structure in mandishi bank we clearly say it is a member capital it is not an equity so there is no concept of wealth is not there but at the same time at where the concept of wealth is there is a concept of accountability and i will be responsible in repayment and those can be worked out in in alternative to wealth so i'm just sharing these things trisha is that i am know that i'm getting into bit technical things but these are very important and why i'm sharing is unless we discuss these things we won't be able to go beyond credit uh, joint liability group lending to individual lending because individual lending comes with a risk in joint liability group lending there is a peer pressure of four other women who are going to help to repay the loan in individual lending no and women there is no and you are talking about non collateralized collateralized loan because women do not have property so these collectives are going to play the role of collateral and which means that these collective capital is going to play the role role of equity wealth whatever you say as an collateral so these partnerships are very very important and I'm, i i shared with the sibbi and prayas but also while doing this partnership sometimes we have to take the responsibility that our partners have to redesign the way they are working with the last mile borrowers who are in a very different situation here i would like to give you the example of jandan account in india there is a jandan account where and unfortunately it has a very big component of jandan account is not just opening the account but if women say street vendors they open this jandan account there is a component of for 10000 rupees overdraft facility now that overdraft facility is made available for the working capital of the micro enterprise who are most below like who are street vendors right so say i'm giving you one example so we did partnership with them also and we said we will get jandan account open but provided our women will be able to get with state bank of india i'm talking now the partnership before i talked about sitbi small scale industrial development corporation where individual lending was given now i'm talking about the partnership where we did with the state bank of india under jandan and we said they will oh, we will get their account open we will get them to do transactions we will we will get their digital uh, i mean mobile banking so mobile number linked with the account and but provided they get overdraft facility under the jandan account which means cash credit where which helps them to have a working capital loan that type of and we will make sure that these loans are does not become npa because you have to make banker confident and con about the npas particularly otherwise bankers will not come forward so here i would say trisha that while designing the partnerships you have to work out what are my pain points and what are the pain points of partner and make it negotiable in that way that how we can while doing this partnership how is it possible otherwise as ajayta mentioned that you have come up with a great idea of startup and then you realize that these startups only iitians can do it no other people can do it i mean we have we have done lot of things and given lot of things to iitians right so there's no need mit is there for them india government does not need to do anything for iits mit is doing so i find it's very and i rightly you ajayta rightly mentioned like um, it's so important that for whom you are designing the or whatever government policy is there it is addressed to whom and understand the ecosystem of them and and i would lastly give you another example because ajayta did talk about ma'am uh, i'll stop ma'am yeah, uh, so it's, it's extremely interesting and 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 the richness of that you're bringing to this discussion is uh, i i wish we could go on for much longer but unfortunately 
definitely uh, uh, we, we are at a point where we have to open uh, open the floor for uh, Q and A. Um, and uh, mm. so uh, members uh, who are participating, if, if there are any questions that you would like to ask us, uh, address to our speakers, um, you, you can address specific speakers or, or pose a general question, please add those to your uh, chat box and um, I'll pick those up. Um, so uh, thank you, uh, ma'am. Uh, I'm I apologies again for oh cutting God. you off. It's always good to be. We should always have a separate session where we're just all engrossed in listening to Chetna because I just I wanted to, I I could keep I could keep going and listening because I I was taking my own notes of things that I was learning. So just saying. It's fine. Um. So uh, if, if there are no questions from, from the participants, I think uh, I, I could, uh, I think I, I could move on to maybe um, Danica. Uh, right, so I, I don't see any questions from the participants at this time. Oh, we do have one. Uh, this is a uh, uh, address to Lida. Um, so the question is, have you involved education sector in making these women continue improving their entrepreneurial skills while in the adjustment period of learning? What specific roles have they have they extended to these women? Um, it, so Lida, you could take it up or, or if um, any of the other speakers. Uh, would like to weigh in. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So, what I understand the question, which means that do uh, actually investment involve with other education sector into make this um, program move forward or improving the women, right? Entrepreneurial skill, kind of like that. It means like that, right? I, I just afraid that I, I, I understand about the question fully. So um, I, I, I think uh, uh, what this question is specifically referring to is whether you've maybe partnered with players in the education sector mm. in order to improve the, uh, the entrepreneurial skills of women. So mm -hmm. while they are in the adjustment period of, of becoming maybe uh, from, uh, from people who are women who are doing something on the side to becoming serious entrepreneurs. So during this mm. process, have you partnered with uh, players in the education sector to design, I guess, course materials. Yeah, so uh, honestly, it's like all the co-founders, especially me, it is like the learning, <laughs> design the learning, um, uh, all the activity itself. Um, we, we didn't involve uh, any uh, education sector so far. Uh, but we kind of have the consultant and also the um, expertise to be reviewed and our, um, and give us some input around our curriculum and designs and uh, learning activities, kind of like that. Um, and we kind of like put together and uh, revise and practice and revise. We also revise every almost every year. Yes, actually, we not really uh, partner with those sectors specifically, but we are part of it, our government that uh, mainly we are uh, do the MOU with also uh, our, our Ministry of um, uh, Women Affairs. Yes, yeah, so that is that they are play a very important part of um, empowering uh, the women in, this, in, in the country. So because she vision and mission is a big part of their activity so we kind of like uh, work together a lot and how can we uh, work together a lot and uh, back and forth with the suggestion and improvement all the time with that yes and um, what specific does yes uh, so uh, I think uh, most likely now um, like I said I didn't involve it like like ministry or education or kind of like that uh, but we are like really focused on different uh, partnership with different organizations uh, that really focus on um, that that really that 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 really focus on uh, the women economic empowerment um, 
uh, providing skill and entrepreneurship skill to the women so we can kind of partner with those uh, with, uh, organization and also the government itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that answers that question. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Yeah. Um, uh, we have another question. This is addressed to uh, Chetna Ma'am. Um, uh, so, so what, what is being asked here is, was there no difficulty um, in uh, com meeting the compliances of the bankers? Um, banks sometimes um, require so many, they have so many requirements, they need documentations, like duplicates and triplicates and signed and then stamped. Uh, uh, so when you approached them, uh, well, did, was, was it not difficult to, um, for, for them to lend to you? How did you go about maybe convincing? So uh, it's very interesting. I mean, I would just give as you are, the question is about uh, when we did the partnership for the borrowing, uh, uh, getting the loans from the bank for our women entrepreneurs, right? That is the whole question is that, was it difficult to comply with the papers and all to get the loan for? So here I would just say that sometimes the strategy is that uh, it, it should be, the preposition becomes much more uh, uh, in uh, much more vulnerable on our side when they should approach us. It's, it's always I, I prefer that bank should approach you instead of you approaching bank that you please take the loan for your women. We would like to so make your borrow make your women bankable in such a way that everybody wants to give you loan. And how that is possible, I would give you very briefly, is number one, they prepare an I-card which says that they have a very high credit rating. How do you do that? Create the trajectory of their transaction, showing that they have been doing the transactions and they have a capacity to repay the EMI. That is number one. The second one is that make, make sure that the lender knows that uh, they have a capacity to market their products. How we can show them there has to be like either they are part on some e-commerce platform where again, you can see how many orders they are getting or not. So I do think that these such things are very important for a banker to understand that they will be a regular repayer of the bank. Now, other papers are like, what is their business? What are the licenses and all? I think as being a CII part, Trisha, you know that some licensing are required. If you are in a food and drug business, you require a FF, FSASI. So all those licensing are very important when you enter into the mainstream business. So it is important to create a special training program for women-owned enterprise. And, and it is, uh, I mean, I'm just saying Mandishi has Chambers of Commerce for Rural Women. The whole effort is that you have their accounting in place. And these are not to make a very fancy balance sheet, just uh, working capital and buying and selling sheets. And then they have all the licenses. So banks will come to you and say that borrow from us. Once, once you develop that history, then you do not have to struggle with their requirements. Um, thank you, ma'am. Um, so uh, I, I think we are, we are nearing um, the, the time available to us. Uh, I'd, I'd like to request, I, I'll, I'd like to go through each of our speakers uh, and, and collect um, uh, final remarks. So I would like to uh, start with Ajeta. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, good, because I, I, I do have to run in two minutes. Um, I think overall, I think the session in itself was quite um, empowering for me. There are key takeaways that are very um, common and aligned with how all of us are thinking about um, our approach to economic empowerment or entrepreneurial opportunities for rural women, which is uh, design, iterate, and co-create uh, with the rural women that you are working with. I think instead of thinking about barriers, we think about tweaking our designs to enhance opportunities. Uh, for these rural women to come in, whether that's on digital solutions, whether that's on understanding banking opportunities, whether that's understanding on skills development. And actually, I think the fourth for me is market linkages in a, in a much more robust, profound way. Um, personally, I am excited about the ecosystem shift. There is, I think, a huge opportunity when we have people like the four of us really hell-bent on wanting to get more unapologetically involved 
to create gender inclusive opportunities for women. Um, I think the stats have always been in our favor, pragmatically, that investing in women is smart business. It's the key to poverty alleviation and impact at scale. You know, that's been my mantra from day one. But I do think that there's a big momentum now. The key piece will be how do we, as ecosystem players, start coming together uh, more collectively, uh, exchanging our experiences, but then also designing together and coming up with a better way to aggregate some of our work. So, you know, I'm excited to then start working with Mandeshi, for example, to see how our Sahili network can be better supported, but at the same time, design something big and something different that brings those partners together in a different way. I think there's a big space for blended capital. It's very underplayed. There's a huge trend over here around the role that grant, debt, and equity can play. We just need to think outside of the box and really start looking at wealth opportunities. I do think the right talent, thankfully, between the combination of ERIA, CIIE, and all the great leaders, I think there's something that we can do. And maybe hopefully we do another session around that and you know come up with the next big idea that allows us to uh, create even more impact at scale. So thanks everyone. Thank you so very much, uh, Ajeta, for, um, and I, I believe she, she has to leave, but um, some, some great insights there. Uh, moving on to uh, Denika, I uh, would request you to deliver your uh, concluding remarks. So I completely agree with Ajeta. Programs that are meant for role women should really understand the specific situation that role women are in, to understand the social and cultural constraints as well. But at the same time, I think what I really want to highlight is also our role as consumers and how our choices can really impact as women, even though we'll never meet them. But by actually being more mindful and aware in our purchasing choices, we can actually create a better ecosystem that supports them on a grassroots level. Thank you. Thank you, Danica. Uh, uh, so Kachita's model is, is, is truly incredible for, in, in the way uh, it sort of factors in ethical sourcing to uh, making sure that the creators get their, their, their proper wages uh, to its, its uh, a very deep focus on the environment. And um, thank you so much for joining us and participating in this conversation. Um, uh, Lida would request you to um, come in. Okay. Um, oh my God, I have been learned a lot. And uh, so um, I got full to be a, a panel for this discussion. I have been learned a lot from uh, all the uh, panels, yes. So um, it's quite hard to say like what is the highlight because I haven't catch up a lot yet. So what is what's coming to my mind now is like um, uh, I can see like here is like uh, four business role models come up together to helping like a specific solution, a specific problem that happened in the community, and to create a big impact, not just currently but in the long future. So that is that's kind of a role model. So to me, it's a key highlight is like this kind of like a kind of, of like um, a learning or a role model, but there's also a lot of opportunity for a lot of people, for a lot of women that out there that really see what is the problem and they really can come up with an idea, come up with a, um, a vision and a purpose that they really want to do it. So, uh, and the key highlight here, since I start, I don't know, I'm, I'm a uh, co-founder of She Investment or get now, like from the, the bank. So, uh, uh, and and, and uh, Lenica, so yes. Um, so I think the, the, the most important is like, we need to believe our purpose, yeah? And when we believe our purpose, we can influence the people around us and we can try to find the right people to come in and create this opportunity. So, so which means that the, 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 the thing is very important that you need to believe that your side can be so even a small problem in the community, yeah? So even if you see like this is a, the problem that happened with my community, with the women in the community, and I can be a part of that solution. Just believe that and go out there, create a network opportunity, speak to them and talk to them and just do one small thing at the beginning that make like a huge wait until a perfect it's there never 
happen. Okay, it's just a small action at a time, and you gonna make a huge impact in the future. And like me as example, I I I never thought that I go big like this. Never thought when we started the first, like never thought like this, right? But when we go there, we 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 so inspire all the story that we made. The story of the women that we work with, the story that they talk to us, and every single day it inspires us to even create more bigger. And I believe that I just started, and now I do edit it, and I really want to encourage a lot of more women out there, or all the men, whatever. Okay, <laughs> if you say that something that you believe, and and you really want to try, just take one step forward. Thank you. Thank you so very much, um, Lida. It was a pleasure speaking to you. And uh, I wish you all the very best for all your future endeavors. Um, uh, Chetna Ma'am would like to bring you in here and uh, maybe hear your concluding thoughts. Yeah, thanks, uh, Trisha. And I just wanted to make uh, one uh, particularly statement or comment is that you know, if uh, CIIN area, these platform comes forward, particularly to support these micro, I mean, women-owned enterprise and create and see that how the different uh, organizations who are supporting them, uh, I, I would just like to say it becomes very important to say that whatever is being brought in into the space, capital as Ajaita mentioned has to be very clear if it is a credit yes it is a credit be very clear this is the interest rates and all if it is a grant of course you get the grant with the whatever program you decide but if it is a social impact fund then it has to have a, a low interest or low return social interest because you want impact in return with your investment. So I find that when in blended finance or everything, people do talk of social impact, but generally it is not social impact because you also want return and you also want impact. So two together, you cannot, you cannot have everything. No? When you want impact, which means that you have to sacrifice a little bit of uh, return. And I do think that these things should be spoke very clearly on the platform that people those who are say that we are social impact investors be ready to sacrifice your return thank you ma'am um, I, I think everyone will agree that there is a tremendous scope for synergy for uh, for individuals such as yourself, um, Ajeta, to come together and, and talk about the models that, that we can expect to see in the near future and that we can together build for the near future. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I, um, I'd like to speak up. once again, thank all our uh, four speakers for joining us and all the participants who took the time to, uh, uh, to, to sit through the program. And I'd like to pass on the floor to Julia for um, her concluding remarks. Julia, over to you. Thank you very much, Trisha. Uh, I think we had an amazing discussion. We all learned a lot by these fantastic speakers uh, we had today, so I don't have very much to add. Uh, I just want to say that this is the beginning of a conversation, so I really hope that we will have the chance to welcome our speakers back um, because there's so many so many more things to keep discussing, to keep understanding. Therefore, uh, many, many thanks once again to all of you uh, to stay uh, here with us until late in the afternoon. Uh, and yeah, let's stay tuned, let's stay connected. Um, and I think we can now close the webinar since it's beginning to be a little bit late. Thank you so much once again.